This is football. I'm Kevin Clark. Thomas Dimitrov, former Falcons GM, former NFC champion, joins me in a minute to talk about how the best teams in football were built. Very funny Howie Roseman story. Not a much of a surprise that he mentions Howie when we talk about how the best teams in football were built. Some Dolphins talk. Um, really enjoyed this. Some college quarterback talk. Uh, good insight with Thomas. I think he's one of the smartest guys who's worked in football in the modern era. Um, very quickly, uh, this is something we don't get to. Brock Purdy's in concussion protocol. Just from the timeline of how these things normally work, sounds like he won't play Sunday against Cincinnati. Um, I'm going to kind of zag here because the take from everybody is, let's see how Sam Darnold does. Oh, boy, he's going to play just as well as Brock Purdy and show everybody. Uh, I would exercise caution on any and all takes. Any and all takes. First of all, um, you can't knock Brock Purdy and say he's a small sample size champion and then draw any conclusions from one game with Sam Darnold. Even if he plays lights out, everybody plays better in the Kyle Shanahan offense. I think you saw the stat a couple years ago about how basically anybody who's ever played for Kyle Shanahan is like seventh or eighth all time in yards per attempt. That's just what happens. So there'll be a bump from Sam Darnold. We might see the best Sam Darnold we've ever seen on Sunday. That doesn't mean he's better than Brock Purdy. Um, one of the funny things about Formula One, I always talk about how, and I literally I've used this example before, where I, I always say, because like, the teammates drive the same exact cars, and you get to go against your teammate in the exact same equipment. And I always say, like, the NFL analogy would be you get to run Kyle Shanahan's offense with every skill guy, the whole deal, and then you get to see someone else run the exact same offense. Now, Sam Darnold's not running the exact same offense. Trent Williams is still out. I just saw PFF had them, like, as currently constructed, the 24th best offensive line in football right now. That's not normal. Um, but we're going to get to see some interesting stuff. I just think that any and all takes, I'm, I'm, I'm calling for a moratorium on 49ers quarterback takes for at least three weeks. Because if you've been criticizing or, or betting against Purdy, and I, I'm kind of middle of the road, I think Purdy's done a much better job than Jimmy Garoppolo. Um, I just think we're going to need to see more before we make any grand proclamations. So that's it. Uh, just, just put a pin in the takes, guys. Put a pin in it. Here's Thomas Dimitro. Tickets to the game, merch, meals at iconic restaurants, stays at Caesars Palace. All this can be yours when you bet with Caesars Sportsbook. Win or lose, every bet earns reward credits which you can redeem across the empire. Now, if you haven't started yet, use the code Omaha Full. And then place your first bet up to $1,250. If you win, great. You keep those winnings. But if you lose, you get your stake back as a bonus bet. All right, Thomas Dimitrov is here, former NFL GM, Sumer Sports CEO. What's going on, buddy? I'm just happy to be on. I miss you. Where have you been? I was on paternity leave, and then I quit my job. And now I'm here. <laughs> so just a couple yeah. life events. It's, it's good. And life is going well with the baby. Life is going great with the baby. The baby's great. New job is amazing. It's only been since September 1, but it's been going uh, incredibly smoothly. And I'm just so happy to see what's going on at Sumer Sports, too, because you're, you're thriving as well, buddy. Well, we got a lot going on here, and we can talk about it whenever you want to. But suffice it to say, it's not the same competitiveness that you would be sitting in a GM seat. But every day, there's something across the desk that you're dealing with, of course, especially when you're dealing with eight PhDs in a group of 55. There's a lot of intelligence here that I'm just kind of hanging on in imparting my own wisdom, which is not much <laughs> compared to some of these guys. So it's interesting because you, you're obviously studying how teams get built, how they should get built. And I want to go through the teams you think are built the best this season, because I think that we're looking at a couple of teams. And I think we're all, I'm like so many, it's really funny. I think I heard Chris Long say this a couple weeks ago, and I've been thinking about it ever since that this season, the hot team gets humbled immediately, like immediately. And, and I think that that's, it's always funny. I, there's kind of a running joke. I go on the show around the horn where, uh, and now it's tongue in cheek, but I, I declare all these teams, the best team in football. And then that Sunday they lose and they lose sometimes in convincing fashion. When you think about um, how, how much I believed in the Cowboys earlier in the season, then the Dolphins lost by four scores to the Bills. Uh, the Niners now laid two straight eggs, the, the Lions for God's sake. So I thought they were, were at the top of my NFC power ranking um, 
get their their ass kicked again mm-hmm. and that was dan campbell's words uh against mm-hmm. against the ravens um and so i want to you know kind of remove ourselves from the week to week kind of narrative narrative of it all um and the hype and the the changing tiers and power rankings and just get to how these teams are built um if you were to identify and we'll do we'll do a couple here but um the most impressive team building job for you right now is what thomas Look, I, I keep coming back to Howie Roseman and how he's yeah. putting together the Philadelphia Eagles. And I and you know, look, this this goes beyond just the personnel, Kevin. You know this. And I have a, a very um sort of not soft spot, but I'm very directed towards management and how head coaches and general managers work together, the staff around them, their ownership interaction, which is vital and and of yeah. course you know, where Howie's ownership relationship is, you know, I think is amazing. He's done amazing things through some ups and downs, right? We've had some great conversations about it. The fact that Howie Roseman, not only on the personnel side, on the coaching side, but on the personnel side, I mean, he hires guys like Dave Caldwell. And I've told you this before. Okay. Dave, of course, got released from, from Jacksonville, but he's a, one of the very best evaluators in this league, pure evaluation. Now, of course, opportunities come certain ways, but my thought on, on how he bring in Dave Caldwell and bringing in Matt Russell, who was assistant GM at Denver at one time, really good football people that he puts around him that have a really good understanding of building teams, understanding of football and coaching. Howie by trade, as you know, was a, was a legal guy. Mm-hmm. Howie has done amazing things with getting to learn, getting to know and learn the nuances of this game over these many years. So I, I just want to put that out there, first of all, and I'm, I'm extremely impressed with his approach there. What they have there offensively and defensively, the way that they, they put together their offense with a, with a quarterback that a lot of people were naysaying um, and, and continuing to build around it. I just, again, I continue to come back to Howie's vision and the organizational vision that they have there. A couple of questions. Well, a statement first, which is that I, I don't know. I never heard this from Howie's mouth, but somebody told me this. And, and you look at a guy like Joe Douglas, who was there, believe the year they won the Super Bowl, was instrumental in building that team, at least for a short term. He was obviously in Baltimore before that. Now he's the Jets GM. I remember somebody telling me the one thing Howie's really good at, and there's a bunch of things, but the one thing that stands out is he will get guys that compliment him, which is that sometimes someone like Joe Douglas will come in and say, we need to get tougher. Mm-hmm. And, and, Maybe that's not – obviously, everybody in the NFL believes in toughness, but maybe that's something how we needed reminding of. Let's get tougher. Let's get tougher on the lines. Let's get, let's get meaner on the lines. And all of a sudden, you, you bring in – I mean, it's not like team of rivals type stuff here with Abraham Lincoln, but it's more like, what do I not do? Um, and that's what we're all looking for in coworkers and partners, whatever. It's like, let's, let's round out myself, right? And that's one thing that Howie's really good at. The question I have is – so they trade for Kevin Byard this week, and everybody's saying, oh, how we got this guy for nothing. Kevin Byard, I, I had not met him until this training camp when I did a story on Mike Vrabel. They rave about him, not only in the locker room, in the community, like a perfect guy, like 32 out of 32 teams would take this guy on the roster, and he's a really good player. Um, he just seems like a Philadelphia Eagle. And so my question is, when you're on the phone with Howie, how does he get these guys? Like, is it is he calling all the time? Is he relentless? Is he more like, all right, uh, I'll give you, or, you know, is he a good negotiator or is he just call early? Like, obviously, you've had trade discussions with him because you're just in the same league as him. And, and even though you guys had really good teams around the same time, um, I think you played, you were so good that you played in the first game of the season a couple of years ago after the Super Bowl year. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I'll just leave it to you. Howie Roseman gets these guys how? Well, look, first of all, you look at Howie back many years ago. He used to call and ask for second rounders on everyone. I'd say, Howie, you can't ask me for a second rounder on every guy. To your point, always very direct and aggressive. We joke about it now, of course, and I'm, I'm being somewhat facetious knowing that he's grown and learned, learned over his years about how to approach people, and he's very direct with them. He's a very good negotiator. He, he understands what that organization needs. He has a very good tie with his head coach as well as his team building side. And, and look, call it the way it is. The way the Eagles do things, he, again, I'm soft to this, to this approach. He is a guy that he has final football say. And I do believe with a guy like Howie and an organization like this, Nick Sirianni, I'd really love the way that he coaches. And give Nick the opportunity to coach the football team. Let Howie run the rest of the football team. I think that is so vital 
when you get a young guy in, in a coaching position and he doesn't have a lot of background and you give that dude full final control, even though they may be a, a, able to do that in years to come, it's tough. It is tough yeah. to coach football in the NFL and have all that on your plate. What I'm saying is how he takes control of what he needs to take control of. And he understands, okay, so, I mean, we saw the play. Tariq Hill, by the way, we can all argue he's the MVP of this league right now. <laughs> yeah. The ball going over top of him, I'm sure Howie's up like, they're gonna, this is going to stop. I just think Howie has a really good understanding of not only the here and now, but the next year or two and, and plus in the organization. And that gives him vision on how he's going to do things. I mean, he goes in there, last thing, goes face-to-face, -face, you know, with, with Tennessee and gets a yeah. really good deal done at a damn good price. Yep. When, uh, when you say he wanted seconds, do you mean you would call about a guy, like, you know, the 56th guy on the roster on, on August 20th and he'd say, how about a second-round pick? Yeah, it was, always, it was always a second. I got to a point where I said, Howie, look, we can't do business unless we're realistic. And, he, and we, we, we fixed that. And we have a really good relationship. I have a great deal of respect for him. And growing all the time. I mean, look, you talk to the people in the building, brother. They, you know, again, usually when in football, and everyone probably knows this, there's a lot of protection of the people who uh, are football people, right? They're like, mm -hmm. well, this guy comes in and he's, he's Mickey Loomis and he's a business guy or he's Howie Roseman. He's a, a legal guy. The guys who do really well, and both of those guys have done well, great in this league, it's because they grew, right? And yeah. how we worked to become a football, a football person. And you talk to people that know him well in the building, he's got a really nice eye in evaluating. And he puts the time in on it. Some of those guys don't. And I think that's a, that's a feather in his cap. It's interesting because I've talked to him about this and Tannenbaum and a couple other people about how that generation, and Loomis and Tannenbaum are older, but sure. they got in the door with the cap stuff, as you mentioned, and knowing the cap, knowing the rules, knowing, uh, in some cases, the legal side of it. And I think oftentimes, and then they grew, as you said, they grow with the job. And I think a lot of times, what, every single generation has something to get you in the door. And I actually think it's probably going to be analytics in this generation. We're already seeing that now in places like Minnesota, where it's like, how do you, if you're born in 1990, as someone who wants to be in the NFL, in my opinion, the best way to get in the NFL right now is to be an analytics guy and just start working your way up because that's actually the, the uh, that's actually the roles that are expanding now. Whereas scouts, I mean, some of those scout jobs are like Supreme court justices, man, like the, you're, you're not going to get hired unless something happens, somebody moves up. Um, and so it just seems to me like the new generation of that version of Howie Tannenbaum Loomis is going to be those analytics guys who get in the door now. Um, and also women, obviously, who are, I mean, there's, there's it's incredible uh, diversity throughout the league in those departments um, that we're seeing now. Um, that to me is going to be the most interesting thing. Well, look, I, I completely agree. And not just because I'm working in sumer sports and data analytics, I would not be in this business if I didn't believe exactly what you believe. It right. is the next wave and it's outrageously um, sort of, uh, lacking in responsibility as a general manager, as a president, and as an owner of a team, if you're not looking at data and how you're going to implement your data. There's unbelievable data out there. Kevin, you know this. And if it's sitting there at their, at their feet and they're not utilizing it, I think that's, that's a complete injustice. I Almost criminal. And I know that sounds like, holy sh <laughs> here's a football guy. Here's a football guy who is so backing this. I am because... I believe in so many people in this league. There's some really good football people in GM roles right now who are really good evaluators, Kevin. But think about that. If you are able to take a, a, a good portion of that data and add it to a really good football eye and nuance understanding person, well, that's going to make you the guy who was probably good to being very good or being a potential Hall of Famer. If yeah. you're pushing it aside because you're worried about you know, I'm uncomfortable and data, data is just only goes so far. We're not saying it is the answer, right? I'm, we're, not, we're saying it is an augmentation tool. And if you don't bring, if you don't, if you don't embrace it, then in five or eight years, you're going to have people that do. And I say to people all the time, the young guys spend your time evaluating. Yes. Start understanding data, start taking extra courses in the summer. I would I, 100% because when you go to interview with those owners, and you just, you talk football and they realize, wow, this dude knows football. And oh, by the way, he is versed in what we know is vital. I think it's a no brainer.
I want to get to the analytics part of this a little bit later. Um, I want to ask one more team building question, which is about the Dolphins, which is the reason I'm impressed by it is that we know what Mike McDaniel needs. It's the fastest guys on the planet. And they were able with literally no interruptions to get those guys. When you look at the GPS tracking data, and I understand some of it will be schemed to get these guys at top speed. But on the other hand, when you have this, I believe at this point, the seven fastest instances of guys with the balls in their hands over the season being Dolphins players spread over three guys. Um, that to me, and probably four in some cases, if you look at uh, Mostert, Achan, Waddle, and, and Hill, I just feel like this is a GM who went out and got what his offensive minded head coach needed. And I, I think that in a lot of ways, I think we sometimes overrate team building when it's quote unquote asset collection and these pieces don't fit and you're just getting value and you're saying i'm going to trade this guy who's you know kind of what you were joking about earlier where it's like uh okay well i'm going to get a second round pick for this guy's never good whatever blah, blah, blah. like build a team like the most important thing is to build a team and i feel like chris greer and that dolphins front office have done it i think chris has done a really good job understanding and here's a guy as you know with chris greer who was taking a lot of heat people were wondering yeah. if he was even going to be around there you talk about a long-standing guy who has, has weathered the ups and downs and that is listening and understanding what your head coach needs. Right. Mike McDaniels comes in as a new guy, and I've been a part of that. When I've been a part of coming in with a head coach with Mike Smith, I've been a part of being the incumbent, and, and all of a sudden Quinn comes in, and Dan's got a lot of different ideas, very different than what Mike Smith was. That's not easy to do that. And what Chris has weathered in those years in Miami has not been easy, right? right. Here he is now with a guy who is, who is a very smart, younger guy, you know, uh, outside the box thinking guy, which that's not necessarily Chris, right? Chris had to adapt to that, which that's a major kudos to him. And then going to what you're talking about, provide him with speed coming out of his ears. I mean, ty again, we talk about Tyreek Hill. You talk about what they're doing on that offense with Tua, allowing allowing them just to rip it, rip it off the top. Are they a 70-point team? I don't believe they're a 70-point team. And I'm, I'm <laughs> I am concerned about their defense a little bit. But, I mean, these guys can get back into a game like that, right, as you know. So I just – it's to me, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lauding for the way they're doing things there. It's Again, it's not easy to do that, but I think they're just making some major headway. I mean, we're, last thing is, are they historic? I would love – you know, we could talk forever about that. Are they offensively historic in this league, or is this a shot in the pan? I'm not sure. My only thought on the defense is that if the problem, quote-unquote the problem – is a unit that has Jalen Ramsey eventually coming back and Vic Fangio currently running it. I think one day we're going to look up and be like, okay, we got it. They're, they're there. They're there. Um, I just feel like that's, that's coming at some point, but um, I do think that at least from a speed standpoint, I do think they're a historic relative to the rest of the league, especially in a season. Uh, and I'm going to get to this where defense is, is starting to thrive, but I want to ask you about scouting college stars because there's so much, attention paid to Caleb Williams and Drake May this season and kind of the jockeying for that. And I've mentioned this quite a million times in the, on the show and, and I'll do it again, but like there was a report a couple weeks ago, an anonymous scout saying that the Caleb Williams is peak Aaron Rodgers and all this stuff. And, and I just feel like it gets a little bit out of hand. Um, and I'm curious this time of year, because you always hear, like varying, you know, obviously, like a but I think the, for when USC played Notre Dame a couple of weeks ago, it was something like 12, 12 GMs in the press box watching. How closely are you watching? If you know, and if you didn't have many bad years, but when you knew you were going to be picking kind of top 10, how closely were you watching the college game week to week? Or is it the same process uh, when it's you're just going to kind of get your reports in and then January, February, March start to hone in? Look, I mean, I, I tell people all the time, we all know 32 different flavors, right? Everyone's right. got different approaches. They were raised in different ways. You know, the people that came up through the through the Patriot paradigm are very different than the Pittsburgh Steeler paradigm, et cetera, et cetera. My personal feeling is when you are struggling, when you're a team, to your point before in any conversations we've had, you are looking and you are spending time on the road as a general manager. Remember, there's probably half or more of general managers who really aren't on the road scouting. They're doing a lot of their stuff virtually because it's just that much more productive. Yeah. I mean, Mike Smith, I was out on the road more. Dan Quinn wanted me around him more. And so we spent more time together during those times. They were very different approaches. You are, even if you're totally in charge, you do have to appeal to, to your head coach. So 
but but when you really need someone, you need to be out on the road and you need to watch these quarterbacks or these top players that you're going to be honing in on at potentially the top pick. So you tell me there were 12 GMs there. Yes. I also think there's there's some clandestine elements to it where people don't want people to know that they're there. Whatever that is, the reality is you need to see these cats live, right? You need to see how they troll up and down the sideline, yeah. how they interact. You need to see how they respond, not only on the field. I remember we weren't needing a quarterback, but I remember going up to the University of Oregon when Herbert was in his junior year. And I, I remember watching him close with people like, why in the hell are you here? And I'm thinking, well, <laughs> first of all, I always have Arthur Blank telling me, like, we need a we need a guy who's going to be an heir apparent. Mm -hmm. And remember, you know, Matt Ryan, I mean, he only missed one and a, a half games in his entire 14 year career. So I was probably lulled to sleep a little bit that way. But I did go out and watch the big players because I thought it was very important. Now, remember the last thing, every team has a scouting staff. They all have they all cover all parts of the country. They will your your area scouts, your regional scouts, and your national scouts will res report back to you as a GM on who's hot and who's not, who you need to see because of A, B, and C, and X, Y, and Z. That's really important that you tie into and tap into your scouting staff. Yeah, I, I had asked a couple people in the league, what, what do you even glean from the press box kind of thing? Why do you have to be there? And I'd heard basically like the smart GMs or smart scouting directors, whoever it might be, Watch how the guy warms up, watch how he prepares, watch how he interacts with his teammates, and then he just BSs for the for the for the, <laughs> for the for, from the start of the game until the end of the game, you know, because that's that's you can get that other stuff. Um and now you need to see him on the sideline. Does he is he interacting with his quarterback coach in a certain way? You just want to get the whole picture. Is there anything I'm missing about that? Um just seeing a guy live, is it I mean, I, I kind of think it's not overrated. It's not underrated. It feels like a GM seeing a top quarterback prospect is probably just properly rated, Thomas. Well, there's a number of things there besides eating hot dogs and any of the gear that they yeah, provide, I was gonna say. To eat, which is one thing. But look, there's and Marriott stuff. points, Marriott points. Yeah, and I mean, look, people talk, people yeah. talk, and there are some GMs or especially personnel directors, and you know this, that are moving their way up to being yes, of course. head coaches or assistant GMs. They want their presence to be seen because there are, there are media people there. There are other GMs there. There are, you know, Bill Polian used to be at those places quite a bit, even after he was one that had a lot of say in this league. Hey, I see that guy out every Thursday night. So think about that too. There is a little bit of, uh, oh, I again, about that. yeah, I think it's, it sounds odd and people you think are all every, every GM is all about building his team and he's very myopic. He's not thinking about his next steps or the personnel directors. That's a bunch of crap. Everyone's thinking <laughs> of the building. So meaning, meaning they're human. Yeah. I mean, we all did it. We all made sure that we crossed our T's, dotted our I's. And we didn't want people saying, man, you know, Dimitro's out looking for a quarterback or they're picking the top five. I didn't see him out one time on the road. That's not what that GM wants to be uh, known as. Right. Well, the good news is there's no overt networking and job hopping in media. So I wouldn't know anything that you're talking about. Uh, it's all above board here. Um, that's it. it. I never thought about that. The networking part of it. Um, or just even the, also the one thing I've heard always is like doing the work is seen as part of the process in football. And like, it's almost like you owe it to your coaching staff. I've heard this from front office guys where it's like, you owe it to your front office guys to at least, show face in some places just to show that you're working as hard as, as they are, if that makes sense. Well, yeah. I mean, you want your scouting staff to know that you are out as yeah. a GM and you're not just sitting there eating bonbons all day, right. you know, walking out to practice. I mean, that's, that's the reality, but I think there's a nice mix. You remember Ted Thompson, God rest his soul. I mean, he was on the road all the time. Yes. Even, even Trent Balky in those earlier years was on the road a lot more, I would assume than he is probably now because he understands. And a lot of us do understand you can't be on the road like you used to be as a personnel director, even as an AGM. You just can't. And and things have changed a lot. Of, of course, technologically speaking, most people get to the games. They've already watched all their video on their own device. Right, Kev? They don't yeah. have to go in the scouting rooms like we used to and have to sit in there for 12 yeah. hours beating our heads against the wall. We're so far advanced in the league, or they are now. It's unbelievable. Um, I want to ask off of Brock Purdy's performance last night. Every... The, <laughs> The discourse, no one can be, I was just texting with an old colleague and he was like, no one can be normal about Brock Purdy. It either has to be, he's great, he's an MVP candidate or he stinks. And my feeling is he executes Kyle Shanahan's offense very well. 
he's a normal quarterback. And as much as that, he uh, is probably true of 20, the 32 quarterbacks in the NFL, that they're a product of, of many of their surroundings, the weather, who they're playing and whether or not their skill guys are a good, be healthy. Right. Um, but I'll ask you this since, since obviously, I mean, listen, Kyle couldn't have told you uh, I want this in a quarterback because there was a starting quarterback there and he was locked in, but just being around him, understanding how he runs an offense, understanding how his relationship with Matt developed, because remember it wasn't, obviously you remember, I'm just telling the listener, it wasn't totally perfect right off the bat. It took a little bit um, for that to develop. So big question, what does Kyle want in a quarterback? Well, I mean, look, I think Kyle wants the understanding from the quarterback that Kyle has some guru elements to him in his system. Right. I mean, the guy grew up with his dad, who was one of the special minds in this business. That's not easy to, to turn that over to, you know, an arrogant or, or an ego driven quarterback. Right. So my personal feeling is he wants, of course, he, to lead it off. He wants someone that's going to be listening to him and taking his directive. He doesn't want a guy that's just going to be popping off on every every different thing. Not not saying that he doesn't want intelligence coming his way, but I think I think Kyle would be at loggerheads with a quarterback who is a know it all, right? And you think of some of them, some of them out there. You might mention them, I might not, and it would be complicated for him to work with them, even as good as they might be. I think Brock Purdy to me is a really nice example of a guy who has enough confidence and understands on the field but he knows what's right and wrong and, and what not to cross with his head coach. There are other head coaches out there that don't mind their head, their, their, their quarterback, you know, just riding big. Right. I don't think that is him. I think he wants an, an athletic enough guy. He wants, of course, a smart guy. He wants a guy who's going to have, he's going to put the time in a hard worker and is going to, again, understand the nuances of the system and not just wing it off of athleticism. Right. I don't, you know, so, it, to me, it all starts, though, however, with an understanding of what that place is for that quarterback and what is expected of him. And I think Kyle's very direct with all of these things about what he expects. And look, his dad as well. His dad, I mean, I know I'm going over from, from quarterback to running back. You saw what his dad did in Denver in those years yeah. with midline running backs. He put him in the right place to survive. And they believe so much in their system and their intelligence in their system that I think they believe they can do it with a lot of more midline type of players. I'm not calling Brock Purdy midline. I'm just saying my concerns for Brock Purdy, if we get off on this topic, can he really, can he, can he correct it if they're playing from behind? And I know there's been a lot of discussion about that. When they're playing in the front, I mean, San Fran is rolling. I'm not saying they're front runners, but man, when they start, when they start getting their mo movement and McCaffrey's rolling, quarterbacks rolling, it's unbelievable. Playing behind is a little more complicated, of course. Interesting. Um, so the Patriots, a place you know well, you work there, you know the Patriot way from the scouting side of it. And it's actually just talking about Michael Holly's remarkable books that documented sort of the tree that, that you guys were a part of and, and how you guys changed football, um, not just in New England, but in Atlanta and Kansas City, some of these other places. Um, it's changing there. And we've never, obviously, and listen, like, I, it was so funny to watch that Bills game on Sunday and people shocked that somehow Bill Belichick found a way to beat a better team. Like, he's the best coach in history. It has felt to me like there's there's some structural problems there, but, like, he's still capable of a really good game plan and, and stifling a team that's better than him. Okay, but having said that, it looks to me like there's a talent deficiency. It looks to me like they haven't really hit. Uh, Christian Gonzalez is like an awesome player, but he's out for the season. There's just been a rut of um, bad drafts, frankly. Um, and I'm curious, as someone who's so well versed in that, um, is this what what happened? How do how does how does Bill fix it? Because it sounds like he's going to be the one to fix it. Um, sounds like they're not going to make a move. But how do you how do you uh, change the roster talent in New England? Well, let me start by saying what you said. I mean, I categorically believe Bill is the best coach in modern history at so many levels. And I still think he is. By the way, I get a kick out of people saying, oh, you know, he's in his 70s now. Bill Belichick, when he walks into owners meetings and the you know meetings we have in the spring, um, I mean, he, he still runs that place. I mean, he'll come in. He'll not only be in the head coaching meetings, he'll come into the GM meetings and sit down and 
it, I remember the last time I was there and I remember him walking in and there was like this, like buzz and the scuttle. It was kind of interesting. Like, wow, Bill's in here. It was pretty interesting to see how, you know, he has so much respect in the league. I, I don't need to, this isn't all about, you know, Bill and, and lauding Bill, but the reality is my mind has always been if, if Bill goes anywhere and there's a, if there is a decision by Mr. Kraft to make a move like that, I mean, I think there are four teams lining up and even teams saying, I believe this team saying, I, I like my head coach. I don't love him. And if Bill's available, I mean, I, I would make that move, right? Would, would that be the case? I mean, believe me. And so I just say, I mean, I just can't imagine Bill is, uh, you know, how many, how many games is he away from the record? 28? Uh, something like that. Yeah. Something like that. I just, he won, I mean, he won 300 on Sunday. He won 300, right. I think it's 28. I just, uh, I guess my point there is I'm getting off tangent here. I'm sorry about that. My feeling is if he goes somewhere else, that's a no brainer. He'll end up somewhere and he'll be able to rock and roll with that team and still has it in him. Back to your question. We start talking about top tier quarterbacks, right? I mean, yeah. let's call it the way it is. Is that where we are? Is it going back to the, to the well, trying to figure out how you're going to get another top tier quarterback there? you know, versus someone who's, who's doing this right now. Right. I mean, Max had his games and he's, you know, I, I don't know where they are with that, but I mean, that's a big thing. And when Tom Brady was there, they could get by with, you know, some good receivers, but not elite receivers. And now, you know, we're, we see around these teams back to Miami playing with elite receivers to help that quarterback out, you know, unless you have the top tier, top tier a quarterback, i.e. like they did with Tom Brady, I think it's it's imperative that you're starting to build those pieces around the quarterback more. That's my take. And I we did it with Matt Ryan. Mm -hmm. I think Matt was an upper tier quarterback. I never uh, respectfully called him a top three, but I thought, you know, we always gave Matt, we gave him tight ends, we gave him running backs, we gave him receivers. He was always teed up, right? I think they need to do that, continue to do that respectfully in, in uh, New England. So I know this is a broad question, but you were in three places that weren't New England in the NFL. And obviously Atlanta is the place you ran, so you can't really say like, oh, we did it differently here. But you are in uh, Kansas City and you were in Cleveland there for a while before you got to New England. I'm curious how different Belichick's scouting method was than the places you were previously. And what, you know, and even from talking to people around the league, like what he did that was different. Because I mean, you think you've always heard the broad strokes where it's like, he wanted to know what a guy could do, not what he can't do. Um, he wanted to, I think the, the, I've always heard the thing about the board where they basically keep a pretty rigorous board that not only tells you where where they rank their players, but how a college player would fit in there on their current roster. It just seemed to me like very total, I guess you could say. He was always looking at the big picture. And I'm curious as someone who was there, who was scouting for Bill, what makes Bill the scout different? Yeah, I mean, you you hit all of the the really important parts, right? I mean, making sure that you you could never get away being a personnel man in the Patriot paradigm if you weren't direct about how this player was going to improve that roster, right? He didn't care. I've also mentioned this many many times. He didn't believe you had, as we've seen in his scouting, that you needed to have the very best at that position universally. He did believe, though, however knowing what he wanted, how he wanted to play that player, that if that player did the three things that he needed him to do, the better than the, the better player who could do 15 of those things, he would still consider that player. I used to look at that as guys like, and again, respectfully to Teddy Bruschi and Mike Vrabel, they were, they were good football players, but they weren't guys that were shining where people were like, well, these guys are just the best we've ever seen. But they played for Bill what he wanted him to play. And, and this goes back to making sure that Bill would sit down and Scott Pioli, as you know, Scott yeah. was really good about having all of his, his uh, table time with Bill. And then Scott would come and make sure that he clearly disseminated the right information to our scouting staff so that when we went out on the road, we were armed with lucidity regarding how the team was being built and the exact nuances we are looking for from our players. There are too many systems out there that I think are sort of whimsical. You got a GM and a head coach are kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. They're kind of working together, but kind of not. We kind of know, you know, the background of the coach, but we don't like as far as the, the, the scheme 
And then you get some infighting and arguing about who truly has final say. And when a head coach has final say, it's one thing. And when a, when a GM has final say, Kev, that's another thing that can be really complicated. And there are a lot of teams like that right now that when you talk to their scouts on the road, they're like, I'm not really sure, man. I'm just, I'm just grading for the league and I'm going back <laughs> and saying, this guy's a really good, he's an A player or he's a 6'5 or 6'8. And then we're going to let our GM and our personnel directors take care of it when they, get, when they take our reports and they read them. To me, that's not the way to approach scouting. So, you know, there are people that take shots at Bill, you know, in the second rounders, right? But, but Bill has hit on a lot of players, and, and to Bill's credit, he's always been very, very direct about what he wants, and that's, that is un, unlike some other places. As Interesting. Um, all right, I want to get to badasses, but I want to I talk about your work with, with Sumer Sports a little bit, and I'm curious, you're in the league, you relied on analytics when you're in the league, and obviously things had changed. It's amazing your tenure in the league, 08, I know – I know what feel and that was when he became Falcons GM, but I know it, it it doesn't seem that long ago, but 08 might as well have been 1970 in some ways in football for me. When I think, when I talk to people in the league where it started to modernize seven, eight years ago, where you talked about the technology where it's, you can watch, I remember talking to your boy, Dave Caldwell um, around like 2013, 2014. And he was like, you can watch 16 games of a player or 20 games of a college player in the time it used to, Hit you, get you to make watch four because of the way the cutups are done. You don't have to get some guy doing projection, uh, projection work, whatever. Um, and I don't mean projection work like analytics. I'm about literal, like a projector, like like getting the tape ready to go so the GM can watch it. Um, and I remember, like, I remember doing a story in 2016, and they were telling me that like uh, you can like computers can now draw up the plays with tracking right and so you don't have to actually draw the plays and then there was a whole bunch of coaches who loved drawing up the plays and said no 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 no, no. we can't have the computer draw it up we have, it's valuable for the quality control guys to do that and it's like no the nfl has changed many times over um all this to say a long way to say that you were you started in a league that i felt very old school. And although football will always be some elements of old school, because like we said, toughness will always be, always be important. So much analytics came in to play midway through the last decade. So much sports science came through midway. Um, and I'm curious now being full time, looking at a lot of these different numbers, being able to consult and roster evaluate and you talk about the PhDs and the GMs you have on staff. Um, what's the number one thing you think you've changed your mind on in football or, or have a fuller picture of now that you're doing this kind of work as opposed to when you're uh, on, on the road grading a player um, in 2009, 2010? I, I think, you know, there was a time there, as you were mentioning, in eight and even before that in the early 2000s, where if you were known as a statistical scout, if you were popping off about the stats and, and, the, and what we didn't even call analytics back then, Right. and you were writing the report and you were delivering it to your staff, you would be kind of ostracized. Like, oh, this guy doesn't believe in his eyes. He has to rely on numbers and data. <laughs> How ridiculous that is. But that was the way. It was almost like a feather in your cap if you could just go point blank and you could just say, I watched all this film. Screw you all who are commenting on right. the amount of interceptions or PBUs. Those were all basic, basic box score things. I mean, it's so advanced now with what we're working at at Sumer Sports and, and other third parties, as you know, PFF, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera over the cap, what, people, what they're drawing from these, these, uh, these companies now to provide the extra layer of, of sort of confirmation on putting together your team. This isn't just about going out and evaluating players. This and what we're doing at Sumer Sports is it is about roster optimization. Remember, we have... I mentioned we have 55 of, uh, employees on our team. We have uh, about, I think it's 38 data scientists and engineers. By the way, there is no team out there that has probably more than five, six, or seven at the very most. And right. they're not just focused on roster optimization. They're focused on providing coaches, you know, game planning, all of that. We are strictly on roster optimization. So what we're doing is we're creating all these algorithms that can help teams when they're looking at, you know, how they're projecting to go out into free agency or how they're projecting to pick their draft picks, how they compare with, you know, 
I'd, I'd say probably 50 models that are popped into our algorithm right now. We have a lot going on here at so many layers that to me, if you're not looking at that, what I've learned now is if I could go back and if I would ever were to ever go back and have an opportunity to be a general manager again or a president or I was if or I was giving a consult to owners, I would say categorically make sure that your upper management group, whether that's your AGM or, or your, your chief of staff, is a data person. You have to have, to me, and I am, I am football through and through. You know this. I have old school. Yeah. From the day I was born, I've been around it for 30 plus years. My dad was a longtime scout. I believe in it. I am not whitewashing it. I am saying we are completely missing the ball and missing, missing the point if we aren't utilizing as general managers, what's at our, our disposal. You're, 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 it's so myopic, right, to come away. And I would say that not just for the, the evaluation and putting together your team, Kevin, I also believe, believe me, you get me started on this, you start talking about, you start talking about analysis and picking your, your coaching staff. The fact that we are picking coaching staffs with a lot of loyal loyalists as your, right. as your, as your background, instead of, Hey, we have a ton of data out there that we could go to the head coach and the owner and the president and say, here's a staff that the head coach wants. And by the way, you know, this very quickly, every head coach, for the most part, it's his staff to pick, right? Even if the, you have a, you know, completely powerful GM who has all say in the world, he's going to give the head coach the choice on picking his staff and the ownership group. There are some ownership groups out there that are just letting the head coach just pick pick coaches that are his buddies. That's right. changing, man. You there is no way if you don't throw up on the proverbial board with your 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 stakeholders, and you have five linebacker coaches, and you're saying I like this guy, and it's because that guy went to college with him, like that, that guy, whatever. It's not that anymore. It's being able to prove what these guys are doing with the teams they've been around, who they're developing, how they develop. And, and making a decision on the coaching staff. So coaching consultancy is ripe for data at this level beyond what any NFL team has used in the past. Just like, just on another, another line, I mean, you talk about that and, and just like the NCAA, there are a lot of opportunities and the agency side that you could yeah. fold in all of this data that was never available before Definitely. that could help fold back into our world as general managers. Wow. Fascinating stuff. Um, I love what you're doing. We'll send you out on badasses. You know the drill. Anybody you came across on the Falcons teams, against those Falcons teams, Patriots doesn't matter. You have a long and storied career. Uh, most badass football guy you were ever around, Thomas Dimitrov. You know, look, I, I, I know that we want this short. I love guys like Laurie Malloy, and I love some of those old badass guys from from the from the Patriot paradigm time, Patriot time. But I got to go with Matt Ryan, and I say that only because Ooh. that dude got his ass kicked. I'm raising my hand on some of those old lines that we had together, and some of them here. <laughs> we weren't always thriving. I mean, I mentioned it before: one and a half games in 14 straight years, and he took some big time hits. So I, I want to laud Matt for that. I think he deserves to be up there in his own way. You probably not heard that many quarterbacks in this world, but I'm, I'm a big believer. I love defenses, but to see a quarterback like that thrive as he did over many years was huge. Was there a, a game where you're just like, man, I cannot believe he's hanging in there right now. Yeah. I mean, there were probably a number of them. I can't, I can't jog, jog my brain on that, but yes, there were, there were a couple of them that I just thought I would look over at Arthur blank and I'd say, Arthur, we're about ready to get this contract going and $30 million. We need to, fold all of this into his you know, 30 million <laughs> hazard pet when we're thinking about it. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thomas Dimitrov. Thank you so much for coming on. This is football. We'll see you soon, man. See you brother.